Good morning. My name is Michael Schuessler. I'm a professor of the humanities at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, located in Mexico City. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself before we begin. Um, I completed my PhD at UCLA in Los Angeles, and my specialty was the literature of colonial Latin America, especially that of New Spain, which is now called Mexico. And today, um, my dear professor and colleague, Lois Parkinson Zamora, has asked me to speak to you uh, a bit about the great Mexican poet, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. And in order to do that, what I'd like to begin with is an introduction to the Renaissance and the Baroque, because only through a complete understanding of the Baroque, and in particular the Latin American Baroque, can we attempt to understand Sor Juana's life and Sor Juana's work. Now, as many of you know, the Renaissance is a rebirth of Greco-Latin culture. It's a reassessment of classical art, literature, architecture, politics, etc. What many people don't realize is that this rebirth and this rediscovery was made possible by a cultural group, a religious group, that has been continually vilified uh, by European history, and they are known as the Moors, those of Islamic culture. This culture flourished in southern Spain, in an area now known as Andalusia, Andalusia, during the Middle Ages, and this convivencia, or convivance, has been celebrated because it demonstrated that religious people of different faiths, in this case Christian, Muslim, and Jewish, could actually cohabitate and assume great cultural production. Well, it was precisely the time of cultural and political domination of the Moors in the 8th and ninth centuries of our era that many of these texts that had been written by Aristotle by Thucydides, by Sophocles, that is the Greeks, and Horace, Cicero, Catullus, and Virgil, that is the Romans, were transcribed, translated, copied, documented by this cultural group. And it was only through their reproductions that many years later in Italy, in the 14th century, that the works of these great thinkers, these great philosophers, these great writers in general could be read again. I always recommend that the student look at a movie that was done in the mid-1980s with Sean Connery called The Name of the Rose in order to understand better this interesting opposition between medieval culture on the one hand and Renaissance culture on the other. The medieval culture tending to look towards the sky and towards the afterworld, whereas the Renaissance man, and to a certain extent women, woman, were concerned about things going on in the earth at the moment. And the Renaissance was just that. It was an anxiety to learn and understand the world and the heavens by empirical, albeit pseudo-scientific means. Consider the studies in nature by Leonardo da Vinci, for example, the development of a tank, of his helicopter, or the painter, Piero della Francesca, who invents perspective and applies it to the two-dimensional picture plane. Indeed, the first image that we're looking at, right here behind me, is a, an image that is inspired by the theories of perspective uh, developed in Italy by Piero della Francesca and in Northern Europe by the great painter and engraver Dürer. And in this image, which I'm looking at, at the, on the computer screen, I think you can see the harmonious nature of the um, construction of space, the illusion that's created through the mastery of perspective, geometric perspective in this case, and the fact that there is a vanishing point at the very center, in the very back of the painting, where all lines converge, and this helps create the illusion of perfect reproduction. No? 
Now, others that were involved in these great feats of the mind um, and in the great expansion of the limits of knowledge were Galileo, Kepler, and Copernicus. And these would be astronomers and great thinkers who would be quite influential to Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz years later. And with regards to the Americas, the very discovery and colonization of what is today Latin America and North America may be considered a gesture inspired by the Renaissance. That is, in this case, Columbus and Vespucci uh, with many medieval undertones. For example, Columbus, who used uh, technology of the Renaissance and had a bold attitude regarding the possibility of reaching the other side of the world by heading in an opposite direction, based his thoughts on calculations that were indeed incorrect because they left out a very important part of this globe which would later become the Americas. That is why perhaps until he died, he was convinced that he had landed in what were the outlying islands of China and Japan and not in the so-called Antilles or in the Caribbean, where indeed a later explorer by the name of Vespucci would realize and he would refute the ancients and say the ancients were wrong. This is a new world and it's no surprise that his first name is that of our country, of our continent, which is Americo or America. Columbus, on the other hand, his voyage could be considered that of confirmation, where he had read in medieval texts, he had read in Marco Polo, he had understood through careful exegesis of the Bible that where he was to be was a place that he already knew about. And he used every occasion that he had in order to demonstrate this. So whenever he saw something that reminded him of Asia, he would point that out as demonstrating that indeed that is where they were. This next image is a fascinating one that shows a scholar and his young disciple using some of these great tools that were developed during the Renaissance, some of which came from a Moorish or an Islamic uh, scientific tradition such as the astrolab. These are instruments that would become so important during the Renaissance and that would allow these great discoveries to take place. Now in the Renaissance, as this very well-known drawing by Da Vinci uh, will illust il illustrates, man is the measure of all things. Machiavelli, for example, is the perfect prince. Hernán Cortés, the conqueror of Mexico, is an archetype of this attitude. He certainly knew how to divide and to conquer. Mercantile developments during the Renaissance, that is Italian banking, guilds of artists and craftsmen, for example, were also important and kind of definitive of this period. All in all, a man was a master of all things, the sword, and the pen. And that is an important concept because it will be very uh, visible when it comes to the first chroniclers who describe this so-called new world. Now, in concrete terms, the Renaissance, and as you will see, this is opposed to the Baroque, involves an appreciation of that which is natural and verosimil, which is an idea developed by Aristotle and this in art and in literature. That is, art is an illusion. Art imitates nature, and that is its highest aspiration. In language, Juan de Valdez and Antonio de Nebrija consider the importance and validity of vulgar tongues. That is, Nebrija in Spain is the first person to write a grammar, and then later a dictionary, of the Castilian or Spanish language which allows it to be studied and to be appreciated in ways that will later be demonstrated through poetry and other works of fiction. That is, they begin to write not in Latin, not in Greek, but in their own quote-unquote vulgar tongues. And one of the first people to do that 
was Dante Alighieri, who might be considered one of the most emblematic figures of the Italian Renaissance. Also, Petrarch, who was of the 14th century in Italy, preceded by Dante, began a tradition of writing in Italian, not in Latin, like his predecessors. Language is based on many tropes, and that is something that's going to become very important when looking at the writing, the poetry, and the prose of Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, in the sense that concepts of false modesty, of hyperbole, of that which is seen and lived, are going to be scattered throughout her work in the way that it would have been in the Renaissance as well, which is an example when I like to point out that the Baroque wasn't the destruction of all Renaissance forms, but it was a variation upon them. It was an elaboration, literally and figuratively. In this time of the Renaissance, man is a rational being who attempts to understand various natural phenomena through investigation and experiment. It is the end of geocentrism, for example, but not for Sor Juana. And this is a very interesting point. Geocentrism, of course, is the idea that the sun revolves around the earth. It is that most religious and Catholic notion that man and the earth are the center of all things. Some of the uh, astronomers who I just mentioned, Copernicus in particular, would um, demonstrate that that was certainly not the case. And others, like Galileo, who had other heretical ideas, would almost be burned at the stake for them. Curiously enough, Sor Juana, writing in the mid-17th century, did not have access to all of these new ideas, precisely because they challenged these long-held beliefs of the Catholic Church. And many of these works, if they ever were published at all, were on the list of prohibited works by uh, the Vatican. So it's interesting to note that in New Spain, there's a certain lag time um, in which these new ideas don't arrive for 30, 40, even 50 years after they're developed in Europe. Now that's the Renaissance. Renaissance, man is a measure of all things. Renaissance is the development of all of this worldly knowledge, this uh, rediscovery and rebirth of uh, great Renaissance, excuse me, great classical works from the Greco-Latin tradition that will inform and inspire the way in which men, and to a lesser extent, and unfortunately women, are to create, are to think, are to put together their famous uh, cities and town councils and guilds, etc. This is all thanks to the Moors, remember, because if it hadn't been for them, um, keeping this culture alive, even though it might have been antithetical to some of their beliefs, we would not have access to it. Now I'd like to oppose what I just said about the Renaissance to what is called the Baroque. Now I'm sure that all of you have an idea about what Baroque means, because it's used, I think, in common talk and conversations. But it's interesting to point out that the Baroque as a term was first used in a very uh, derogatory way. And it comes from a Portuguese word, barroco, which is used to refer to an irregular pearl. So from the get-go, the Baroque at least looked upon in hindsight by art critics and other commentators is considered to be something defective, something imperfect, something not necessarily positive, so to speak. So if one could say that the Renaissance embodies a revalorization of classical forms, straight, linear, symmetrical, ordered, well-proportioned, harmonious, and stylized, that it is a search for perfection through verisimil moderation, something that we might call the just means. And in the human form, da Vinci's drawing is a good illustration of that. In the terms of education, this wonderful painting of a master and his disciple illustrates it quite well. And then to start again with my first image, looking at 
this um, anonymous painting of the ideal city, you see, uh, with its ideal proportion and just means and vanishing point and this notion of illusion that's created through um, these lines that converge at the very end of the painting, all embody concepts that are going to be questioned and are going to be demolished to a certain extent by the European and then later the Latin American Baroque. As I said, the Baroque opposes the ideals of the Renaissance and also its cultural creations without destroying their underlying structure. The Baroque would be considered something artificial, and examples of this abound from the same time period. Obviously, we're speaking about the Baroque belonging to the 17th century, whereas the Renaissance would belong to the 14th and 15th and 16th centuries um, in Italy, and that would take a while to prosper and to disseminate across the, the globe. So Spain had a very little influence by the Renaissance, but a great deal of influence by the Baroque. So remember, uh, the Middle Ages, you know, the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, high and low, and the Renaissance following that, beginning in Italy, and then we have the Baroque, which also, curiously enough, begins in Italy, precisely in Rome, and it is really utilized as um, an iconographical way to educate the masses regarding how to be a good Catholic. Uh, however, there was a period between the Renaissance and the Baroque that I'd just like to point out, which is called Mannerism. And this fabulous portrait by the Italian painter Arcimboldo of the late 16th and early 17th century illustrates how these artists of this period, so influenced by these incredible, extraordinary creations in stone and in paint by Michelangelo Buonarroti, by uh, Raphael, for example, really didn't know how to top such creation, considered absolute perfection by the people of the time, biographers like Vasari, for example. So they resorted to creating distorted, um, exaggerated, hyperbolic images in paint and in sculpture, um, virgins with extremely long necks, or in this case, a portrait of a young man done entirely in leaves and flowers. This belongs to a collection that has to do with the seasons. So you'll see that some of them, this I believe is spring or summer, and there's another one that's the fall, where the poor man's nose is a turnip, for example. No, this is absolutely, desperately trying to find a new mode of expression and a la maniera de, in Italian, is where we get the term mannerism. So it's in the manner of Michelangelo, in the manner of Raphael, but it also is consciously trying to be, dif to be different. The ingredient that will, I think, create the transformation into the Baroque would have to do with the great importance of the Vatican, of the Catholic Church, and what is called the Counter-Reformation. That is a defense and an attack against um, the multiplying hordes of Protestants that were growing in Northern Europe and which represented a serious threat to the Vatican's control on the mines and the pocketbooks and the politics of the entire Western European area. So I'd like to say that we have the idea of the artificial going back to that in this painting from the Mannerist period, but then also in certain very important emblematic works of the Spanish Baroque. And I think that the best example that comes to my mind is this image done by Diego de Velázquez called Las Meninas. And here we have a very clear example of one of the techniques of the Baroque that you will find in painting and in literature. Just as in Cervantes, you'll find a story that's told within another story, kind of like uh, Russian dolls. One is inside the other, inside the other, inside the other. You can see that in this painting, if you look carefully, where 
the back of a portrait being painted is facing us, as is the painter. However, we assume that what is being painted is the scene of Las Meninas and her court, their court, that is in front of us. However, there has been a lot of debate regarding what is the ultimate subject of this painting. Um, Michel Foucault would say that it is the spectator, the viewer, him or herself, and that this bridge created between the artificial world of the painting and the real world of the spectator is an important aspect of the Baroque and the plastic arts. Others would say that he's actually painting the royal couple, that is the king and the queen, and that they're reflected in the mirror behind him. But be that as it may, we have an example of meta-painting, that is, a painting within a painting, which you can see clearly by the back of the canvas that's facing us uh, as we look at the portrait, be us or not the subject of that painting. In Cervantes, you can find a novel within a novel. Uh, in Hamlet, uh, looking into the Anglo um, tradition, we have uh, a play within a play. That is, in Hamlet, if you recall, um, the queen watches a play after committing her crime that has everything to do with the crime that she has just committed. So those dialogues that are created by uh, meta theater are very important in the Baroque. According to its most important theorists, the Baroque possesses a dynamic form and an undetermined vision of reality. This is an idea proposed by the great Italian author Umberto Eco, who by the way is the author of the novel The Name of the Rose, upon which the movie I mentioned at the beginning of my talk is based. Uh, it is an object, that is the Baroque object, is in constant transformation. No longer does it represent essential beauty that is visible to all, but art hides a mystery that must be revealed. And this is an idea uh, first proposed, I believe, by the great Mexican novelist and thinker and critic, Carlos Fuentes. It is the art of that which is unfinished, according to the Russian theorist, Mikhail Bakhtin. So these are ideas that we can certainly apply to Sor Juana and her milieu and to her work in particular. Now, you have to understand as well that the Baroque is born as a reaction against the Renaissance. The 17th century, uh, 17th century Spain is representative of Baroque art and ideology. You have writers such as Pedro eh, Calderón de la Barca, este, Quevedo, Luis de Góngora, and of course the painter Velázquez. All of them participate in one way or another in what is considered the Baroque. On the one hand, in literature, Calderón's Life is a Dream, for example, or the great theater of the world. You can see this notion of artificiality just in the titles. Uh, Quevedo, who is known for what is called his conceptismo, which we'll get into later, Góngora, known for what is called his culteranismo, which we'll also uh, talk about a little bit further along, and Velázquez, whose painting we're looking at right now. So, in both Latin America and Europe, the great distances between the promises and realities of the Renaissance are filled by the Baroque. So just to sum it up, and so you don't get too bored watching this video, I'd like to say that the Renaissance, and write this down, should be considered optimism, illusion, and confidence, whereas the Baroque could be considered pessimism, disillusion, and what is called in Spanish desengaño. And that is really the concept that is going to link all of these works considered Baroque. They might be culturano in the sense that they rescue Latin terms and Latin grammar style, or they might be conceptista because they compare somebody's nose to that of a swordfish. But the bottom line, the idea, the philosophy, the metaphysic that underlines all of these works can be summed up in desengaño. And desengaño is when you realize that something isn't the way that you thought it was. But we'll hold that thought because when we speak about Sor Juana in just a minute, I will get into that with some detail.
Now, I'd like to speak about the Latin American Baroque, something that my colleague Lois Parkinson Samora has written on effusively and in a very brilliant manner, but I'll try to sum up some of her ideas regarding this most interesting variant, let's say, of the European Baroque. First, I'd like to say that the enormous distances between the utopian ideal and the epic reality, between the Golden Age and the Iron Age, between the noble savage and the incarcerated slave, the law and its enforcement, the crown and its colonies, the ancient gods and a modern one, create a desperate emptiness. And this is an idea proposed, I believe, by Carlos Fuentes. This emptiness is filled by the Baroque. It is the preferred artistic style of Latin America. And as we'll see, there are examples from pre-Hispanic America that really could be considered Baroque. And of course, those that come from the fusion of these cultures uh, in a process that's known as counter-conquest. But a term that you should write down and memorize that comes from Latin that really sums up this idea of emptiness is horror vacui, that is horror vacui, the fear of the emptiness. And I think that in this fa facade of a wonderful folk Baroque church in the state of Puebla, you can certainly see what I'm speaking about. There isn't one millimeter that's not covered with some kind of ornament, with some kind of a tile, uh, a motif taken from vegetable models, from animal models, from human models, from architecture, etc. The Baroque is a style of that which is abundant, luxuriant, and exotic. It is the culture of the counter-conquest. It is a response of the new cultures the new races, the mestizos, the mulatos, the tornapatraces, etc. Now, what am I talking about when I mention those figures? Well, first, I'm going to go through a couple images of Horror Vacui, where you can see that the roof or the ceiling of this incredible capilla in Puebla, as well in the city of Puebla, uh, the Rosario, is absolutely covered in ornament, as is a Baroque retablo, that could be found still in many churches throughout Mexico and Peru. Before I speak about these different groups that inhabited this world of uh, syncretism, this world of hybridity, this world of mixing, which is uh, Latin America in the time of the conquest, I'd like to take one example, uh, going back to what Carlos Fuentes said in the sense that one God, that is, European uh, Catholics God uh, is replacing the many different gods of the pre-Hispanic pantheon. Um, as you might know, the so-called Aztecs, I call them Mexicas, um, had many different gods and goddesses, and one in particular whose name was Tonantzin, which means our dear mother, was quickly, shall I say, exchanged or combined with a Nahuatl language speaking virgin of dark skin that appeared in the mid 16th century in the exact same place where this fertility goddess known as Tonantzin, our dear mother, had her temple. And I don't think I have time to go into the description, but this development of the Virgin of Guadalupe, who is also revered in Mexico and in the United States by the Latin American and particularly the Mexican population is also known as Guadalupe Tonantzin, which shows how she has been combined, she's been syncretized with a pre-Hispanic fertility goddess and that she appeared exactly where that goddess had her temple. And the result is this dark-skinned virgin revered by all Mexicans today and in particular, the Creoles and the Mestizos of the colonial period who uh, spoke in Nahuatl to a humble Indian peasant who later presented proof of her appearance and had a hard time convincing Juan de Sumarraga, who was Mexico or New Spain's first um, 
archbishop. Now this curious painting is what is known as a, a painting of castas, or castes, like in the way India is known to have a caste system. In this sense, it is an illustration of the way in which all of these different ethnicities collided in New Spain, and an example about how the New World is a melting pot, a great recipient of all of these syncretic ideas that are considered to be essentially Baroque. As I said, um, is the style of that which is abundant, luxuriant, exotic. It is a culture of the counter-conquest. It is a response of new cultures. Well, the counter-conquest could be considered, in a religious sense, the Virgin of Guadalupe, who was on the one hand a pre-Hispanic uh, pagan deity, and on the other hand, the most illustrious mother of God. Uh, and it's also the response of these new cultures. And they're hard to see, but I think on the side of, of me, in this little box, you can look at some of these paintings up close. But these are always fascinating to my students because they illustrate the coming together, the biological uh, combination of an indigenous woman and a Spanish man who produces a mestizo or a mestiza of a Spanish man and a black woman that might create a mulata. Some words that are considered in English not politically correct um, are used quite commonly in Latin America and places of the Caribbean in particular. So we have these groups, mestizos, I just described, mulatos as well, and others whose names are not at all positive, like no te entiendo, I don't understand you, lobo, wolf, sambo, which I don't know exactly what means, but it's not very nice, and torna para atrás, or tente en el aire, so I really recommend that you look into this um, concept of uh, the caste system. There's a wonderful book by Ilona Katsu called Caste Painting, which you can acquire in English if you're interested. The Baroque is also the hiding place for indigenous cultures. It is a place where America and Europe meet. It is a refuge for women. And that is where Sor Juana will come into play in just a few minutes. The Baroque is also, before we leave it behind, a human constant. It is a spirit that returns cyclically throughout history in artistic manifestations. America, to end with a quote, I believe by Lesama Lima, a great Cuban writer, a country of symbiosis, of mutations and vibrations, of mestizajes, was always Baroque. And I'm gonna put up a couple slides so you can see them while watching this, of important archaeological sites, for example, Mitla in southern Mexico near Oaxaca, whose facade is very convincingly an example of Auror Vacui, and therefore also an example of how the Baroque is a constant. It didn't develop like a style, let's say like the Gothic in France or something like that, but is a human constant that shows up all over the world. Even some of those Northern Indian fortresses, like in Rajasthan, for example, have been compared or considered Baroque structures. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Sor Juana. Um, and in order to do so, I think that I will read very briefly, so I don't forget any of the important concepts, um, a bit about her life. Juana Ramirez de Azbaje was born on the Hacienda of San Miguel Nepantla near Mexico City, the capital of New Spain, probably in the year of 1648. The illegitimate daughter of Isabel Ramirez de Santillana and Pedro Manuel de Azbaje in Vargas Machuca, very long name, the young Juana Inés was raised at the Hacienda of her maternal grandfather, Pedro Ramirez, where she quickly demonstrated an uncanny intellectual ability. Upon her grandfather's death in 1656, Juana Inés's mother sent her to, the, to Mexico City to live with a wealthy aunt and uncle. And in 1664, she became a protege of the viceroy's wife, Leonor Maria Carreto. Although she enjoyed many favors during her life at the court, at the age of 19, she joined the convent of San Jerónimo, where she professed on February 24, 1669, under the religious name 
Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. She became famous in Spain during her lifetime upon the publication of her poems collected as Inundación Castalida of 1689. The title of this book, I'm sure, is incomprehensible to many of you, but it is an example, a very clear example, of Baroque hyperbole in the sense that it refers to a flooding of the spring of Castalida, um, which is where was located on the Champs-Élysées, the, the Campos Elíseos, where all the great writers ended up. According to many scholars, Sor Juana was the greatest poet of the Spanish language in this era, and her death from plague on April 17, 1695, marks the demise of Spain's golden age of literature. And let me just point out that I'm not talking about women writers. I'm talking about the entire realm of Spanish language writers in the entire world. It is considered that she was the greatest of them upon her death of, in 1695. Now, as I mentioned, she was brought up in colonial New Spain. Um, and I'd like to say that there were very few possibilities for women uh, in New Spain. They had basically three. Marriage, the most common. The habit, that is to become a nun. And unfortunately, but true, prostitution. Now, life in the convent wasn't, I don't think, what many people consider it to have been. Although it is true that Sor Juana first professed at a discalced uh, convent, that is where the, the nuns, they didn't run around barefoot, but they wore sandals, but they practiced a rather difficult regime of uh, flagellation and sleeping on boards and things like that. She later ended up in the San Jerónimo convent because she had been, since a, a young girl, rather sickly. And in the case of the Convento de San Jerónimo, the convent of St. Jerome, located in Mexico City and now actually the seat of a rather well-considered public, uh, no, excuse me, private university, um, had many niceties you'd be surprised to hear about. Um, Sor Juana's life in the convent of St. Jerome in Mexico City as being that was a conventual life that was rather lax in the sense that um, it did give her some time to study, to read, uh, to basically uh, experiment and to enjoy life. She was certainly well known for a sentence that she had regarding philosophy in the kitchen when she said, if Aristotle had cooked, he would have written, oh, so much more. So this will tell you how you know, she managed to um, learn while she was fulfilling her duties and spending her time in her study in what was actually a duplex apartment um, that came complete with a maid, where on the first floor she had her living quarters, and on the second floor she had her enormous library of over 10,000 volumes, one of the largest libraries in the Americas at that time, and she also had her scientific instruments. Um, she was cloistered in the sense that she was not allowed out of the convent except on very certain special and dire occasions, for example, when her mother passed away. However, she could have contact with the outside world through um, a space in the convent known as the locutorium. And in the locutorium, it was basically a salon that was divided by metal bars, as if it were a prison. And on the other side, she could receive the viceroy, the vicerine, church officials, family members, and probably her favorite, the great Mexican savant by the name of Carlos de Sigüenza y Góngora, who was the author of some very arcane works, considered an extremely gifted thinker, and one whose claim to fame is having questioned Father Kino's um, supposition that one of the great Haley comets that passed by in their lifetime was actually an example of divine flatulence when Siguen Suegongura demonstrated that the Chinese have recorded this phenomena for many years, and indeed it was more of an astronomical phenomenon than anything else. As I said, she had a servant in her um, cell, which is kind of um, a euphemism because, or not a euphemism, it's really untrue because it wasn't a cell, it was more like an apartment. Now I'd like to look at Sor Juana through her life 
Um, but before that, let me just mention something about the poetry of this time period. Octavio Paz defines the literature of the period as an imported one. It is elitist, it is academic, it is dogmatic, it is hermetic, and it is aristocratic. It is a reconciliation of empirical truth and religious revelation. One could not question religious revelation, and those who did sometimes burned at the stake. The Baroque, poets like Luis de Góngora and William Shakespeare and Francisco de Quevedo, um, practice two stylistic modes that are worthwhile mentioning very quickly. One is called culturanism, and that involves the imitation of Latin syntax. That is, Latin, as a decline language, doesn't um, use prepositions. And therefore, it doesn't matter where a word might be in a sentence it, to make sense out of it. Like the cat on the hat, the cat on the mat, the mat on the cat. You can't say that except in a certain order to create a certain meaning in English, whereas in Latin you can because of the endings of each word. They indicate what those words signify. So culturalism is using the Latin syntax and lexicon, that is, words that are taken from Latin and turned into Spanish to a certain degree, and which was practiced by Luis de Góngora. Uh, and another idea, another um, stylistic mode, is that of conceptism, where one would use difficult conceits, that is, relating two things in a metaphor, but in a way that had never been done before, in a very strange um, com uh, comparison at that. But what I'd like to do during the time that we still have today is talk about Sor Juana's life and work as seen through one of her most important texts. I think that the reply to Sor Filotea, as it is known, that was written in 1691, is a first in many regards. But I think that women in particular will be happy to know that it is probably the first confessional autobiographical work written by a woman in Mexico, period. That is, in the late 17th century. Curiously, it is a reply to a letter that was sent to her by Manuel Fernandez de Santa Cruz, the Bishop of Puebla, where she criticizes Antonio de Vieira. Um, they have opposing views regarding which was the most outstanding fineness of Christ. Antonio de Vieira was a very important Portuguese um, scholar and religious man, and he came to the conclusion that Christ's greatest act was washing the feet of his disciples. And Sor Juana, in what is known as the Athenagorical letter, which preceded this reply, kind of criticized that a little bit too severely and demonstrated through logic and reason and great rhetoric that actually having given man free will was the greatest thing that Christ had ever given his uh, disciples. Because of this critique, Manuel Fernandez de Santa Cruz, who in a curious case of literary transvetism, goes by the name of Sor Filotea, the sister who loves God. So he writes um, pretending that he's a woman. Nobody believes anything but the fact that it is Manuel Fernandez de Santa Cruz, but as an example of this kind of Baroque artificiality. Um, he criticizes Sor Juana's interest in worldly themes in this letter and asks her to apply her talent to the praise of God. He also mentions the publication of this athenagorical letter, much to Sor Juana's surprise. She never thought or never had the intention that this critique that she was asked to make would ever see the light of day as a published, not a book, but just a little um, folleto, as they're called, in Spanish, pamphlet. Athenagoric letter, another example of Baroque hyperbole, it means a letter uh, that is, could be a, have been written by Athena herself. Una carta digna de Atena, is what I'd like to say. In this text, which you have um, next to you, I'm sure, uh, that you can click on, the reply to Sor Filotea, there is included biographical data, as I mentioned, it's the first autobiography that we know, by a woman, it contains stunning erudition, brave argumentation, and is an example, I believe, and others as well, of feminism avant la lettre, 
feminism before there was even such a thing. It is not only an autobiographical account, but it is a for forensic, let's say a legal defense of herself. Now, what is the purpose of this letter, of this work, which I hope that you have read? It is to confess her profound inclination to knowing. It is a defense of the right women have to learn, even inside a hierarchical and rigid society. Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, in this reply, reformulates St. Paul's assertion in order to support her argument. His assertion in Latin was, mulieres in ecclesia tassiant. That is, women must be quiet in church. But she transforms this through her great argumentation, her great erudition, into mulier in silentio discat. That is, a woman should learn in silence. So it wasn't the idea that a woman wasn't allowed to learn that St. Paul was asserting, but that the women were not allowed to preach. That is her interpretation. So she starts by using false modesty, which is something that was inherited from the Renaissance, as you will recall. And she talks about being I the worst of all. She says she is not prepared to write about sacred matters. And I quote, my not having written much on sacred subject is not from disinclination or lack of application, but from an excess of the awe and reverence do those sacred letters for the understanding of which I find myself so ill-equipped in which I am so unworthy to treat. Well, I think it's time that we meet Sor Juana in this magnificent painting done after her death in the early 19th century by Miguel Cabrera. Indeed, there's only one image made of Sor Juana that could have been taken from her own physical self, and that's an engraving in her first book of poems published in Spain. I'll put several of these images up on, online. She emphasizes the impossibility of her responding to this letter criticizing her interest in worldly affairs and says, thus I, my lady, remember my lady is really Manuel Fernandez de Santa Cruz, will answer only that I don't know what to answer. Another example of this very intricate um, rhetoric used during the Baroque. This reply illustrates a constant polarization of Sor Juana's writings. Benevolence versus punishment, especially for the one who excels, and she doesn't have any problem comparing herself to figures like Christ and Moses. But most of all, and I think in most interesting way, she compares herself to sagacious, that is, wise women from classical antiquity and the erudite saints. Catherine, Gertrude and Paula. She is trying to reconcile knowledge with virtue. So the content basically to review begins with false modesty. She says that illness has made it impossible for her to answer. That she is unable to thank the bishop. It just defies, and I quote, confinement within the bounds of language whereas really she's shocked and rather chagrined at having received this, this letter from, from this bishop. And she uses certain phrases in Latin that I think really serve to underscore what her real perceptions are. And the first one is, et unde hoc mihi, where to me? She says, for example, am I perchance anything but a poor nun, the least of all the world's creatures, and the most unworthy of engaging your attention, certainly a use of false modesty. Um, she also really demonstrates her great erudition and style. She says, for example, and I quote, I had almost made up my mind to let silence be my answer. But then she realizes that silence in itself is an answer. And she elaborates upon that point for a paragraph or two. Um, she also demonstrates that she is rather servile, um, that she is willing to accept constraints of her faith, of her sex, of her context, of her birth. It will be, this admonition, equivalent to a precept. That is, she isn't going to question anything that she's been criticized about. 
She is afraid of having trouble with the Inquisition, and rightly so. Um, and she also points out that she only wrote by request. Vos me cogistis, she says. You requested it. And I quote, Furthermore, I have never written anything of my own volition, but always at the request and to the specifications of others. So much so that the only thing I can remember writing for my own pleasure is a trifle called the dream. Now this trifle called the dream is considered one of the greatest philosophical poems ever written, certainly the greatest ever written in New Spain, certainly ever written by a woman, um, which we can put upload onto the site, but is almost a thousand lines long and requires great amount of erudition itself in order to be understood. She also talks about her thirst for knowledge as a natural impulse that God has implanted in me. She becomes a nun because it is her only option. And she says, and I quote, given my total disinclination to marriage. This has made her a hero to different groups of modern uh, Mexico and the United States. Um, it has also been um, theorized, postulated that she was a lesbian, but you understand that the concept of lesbian didn't exist at that time. But she did have what you could consider romantic friendships with two of the viceroys, viceroines, excuse me, in particular. And she ends up by saying, privatio est causa appetitus. That is, privation arouses the appetite. She says the reason that she's been inclined to study so much is because it's been so denied to her. And I quote, what could I tell you, my lady, of the secrets of nature which I have discovered in cooking? If Aristotle had been a cook, he would have written much more. And finally, she ends this very um, brave argumentation, this forensic dis defense of herself and her right to be and to study with one other Latin phrase, me fecit Deus, God made me. Now I think we should go right along and look at a couple of her poems. Uh, one of them, which is certainly related to the image that we're looking at here of Sor Juana, is her sonnet 145. And I'm going to read two different translations of this sonnet, just to make sure that you get uh, the gist or the picture. And it begins, This that you gaze on, colorful deceit that so immodestly displays art's favors with its fallacious arguments of colors is to the senses cunning counterfeit. This on which kindness practiced to delete from cruel years accumulated horrors, constraining time to mitigate its rigid rigors and thus oblivion and age defeat is but artifice, a sop to vanity is but a flower by the breezes bowed, is but a ploy to counter destiny, is but a foolish labor ill employed, is but a fancy and, as all may see, is but cadaver, ashes, shadow, void. And this last line sends us right back to that idea of desengaño, or when you realize that everything is not the way that it is portrayed to be. And it is interesting how she uses something that will last forever, I'm reading it right now, a sonnet, poetry, in order to criticize uh, the plastic image of her in a painting by saying that it's a lie, it's an untruth. It is false syllogisms of color invoking a rhetorical term, syllogism, in order to describe the falsity of her own image. In this case, we don't know if it was an image supposedly she painted of herself and a copy of which exists at the museum, Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, was donated by a Mr. Landborn many years ago. We don't know if she's dialoguing with her own image that she created herself because she did dabble in painting or if it is rather a rhetorical conceit, which is very typical of the time. This is a translation by Margaret Sayers Peden. Now let's um, consider another translation, a more recent one, by Edith Grossman. 
who has recently also translated the Quixote. Sonnet 145, in which she attempts to refute the praises of a portrait of the poet signed by truth, which she calls passion. Now these little introductions, these little subtitles to the poet, to the poem, excuse me, were really done by her editors. So it's hard to attribute when it says imitating Gongora, for example, that says what she thought or what she did. This is what somebody who was uh, publishing the book of poems considered to be appropriate. And this one begins, this thing you see, a bright colored deceit, displaying all the many charms of art with false syllogism of tint and hue is a cunning deception of the eye. This thing in which sheer flattery has tried to evade the stark horrors of the years and vanquishing the cruelties of time to triumph over age and oblivion is vanity, contrivance, artifice, a delicate blossom stranded in the wind, a failed defense against our common fate, a fruitless enterprise, a great mistake, a, dis a deceit, a decrepit frenzy, and rightly viewed, a corpse, some dust, a shadow, mere nothingness. This sonnet itself takes, to a certain extent, the form of a syllogism, where you have something positive, something negative, and then you have kind of the consolidation of the two. So it's a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis. In here, I think the synthesis could be considered a corpse, some dust, a shadow, mere nothingness. And indeed, in the year of 1695, Sor Juana did become just that, victim of a plague, of an illness that um, overtook Mexico City and in which various of her sisters of the same order in the same convent of St. Jerome died. We don't know where Sor Juana's remains are. It is thought that she was buried in a common grave. And up until this day, many people have tried to show one skull or another claiming that that is of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. And I'd like to end on a more, let's say, entertaining note, if you'll bear with me, um, because I did mention that Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz was also, could also be considered a feminist avant la letra. And this poem, this redondilla, as it's called in Spanish, um, I think illustrates this. Just imagine this poem being composed by a woman, a nun, an hija de la iglesia, which is a very nice way of saying a bastard, in 17th century New Spain. Somebody who knew that she wasn't in the best position and was always quite vulnerable. But even so, this is her thought on women, especially the way men view them. Or on men, the way women view them, rather. Silly you men, so very adept at wrongly faulting womankind, not seeing you're alone to blame for faults you plant in woman's mind. After you've won by urgent plea the right to tarnish her good name, you still expect her to behave, you that coaxed her into shame. You batter her resistance down and then, all righteousness, proclaim that feminine frivolity, not your persistence, is to blame. When it comes to bravely posturing, your wistlessness must take the prize. You're the child that makes a boogeyman and then recoils in fear and cries. Presumptuous beyond belief, you'd have the woman you pursue be thais when you're courting her, Lucretia, once she falls to you. For plain default of common sense, could any action be so queer as oneself to cloud the mirror and then complain it's not clear? Whether you're favored or disdained, nothing can leave you satisfied. You whimper if you're turned away, you sneer if you've been gratified. With you, no woman can hope to score, whichever way she's bound to lose. Spurning you, she's ungrateful, succumbing, you call her lewd. Your folly is always the same, 
you apply a single rule to the one you accuse of looseness and the one you brand as cruel. What happy mean could there be for the woman who catches your eye if unresponsive she offends, yet whose complacence you decree? Still, whether it's torment or anger, in both ways you've yourselves to blame, God bless the woman who won't have you, no matter how loud you complain. It's your persistent entreaties that change her from timid to bold. Having made her thereby naughty, you would have her good as gold. So where does the greater guilt lie for a passion that should not be with the man who pleads out of baseness or the woman debased by his plea? Or which is to be blamed more, though both will have cause for chagrin, the woman who sins for money or the man who pays money to sin? So why are you men all so stunned at the thought you're all guilty alike? Either like them for what you've made them or make of them what you like. If you give up pursuing them, you'd discover, without a doubt, you've a stronger case to make against those who seek you out. I well know what powerful arms you wield in pressing for evil. Your arrogance is allied with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Surprising poem written in the mid to late 17th century by a Mexican nun. Very worldly, her knowledge probably uh, acquired during her time at the court, where one is thought that she might have had her pretendientes, know her suitors. And I think with this, we can end. And I wish you a happy semester. And um, I hope you enjoy the pictures. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Yo creo que ya.